This story all starts back when I was about six or seven. I was always a quiet girl that liked spending a lot of time alone, reading or playing. I had a lot of friends but never spent much time with them outside of school because my alone time was always very important to me. After moving to a new city closer to some relatives that I didn't see much growing up, my aunt decided that it would be a great idea if I spent my after school hours playing with her son who was seven years older than me. My cousin was an odd kid. He never got on well with other people and usually ended up being an outcast. He had no friends and spent much of his time indoors watching TV or playing video games. He was prone to fits of rage that usually ended with him breaking things or screaming a lot. He was also a lot bigger than most people his age and was huge compared to me. Around when we started hanging out he was already six foot four and very overweight. He also had what I've come to call dead eyes. When he looks at you it's like he's looking through you and any emotion he showed never reached his eyes other than anger. My aunt thought it would be beneficial for the both of us if we started spending our free time together so he would have a friend and I wouldn't be spending so much time alone. My parents weren't as enthusiastic, but thought it couldn't cause any harm. Everyone in my family always felt bad for my cousin due to him always being alone and having parents that weren't fit to be parents. It was more like I was babysitting him more than anything, which, looking back, was a horrible situation to put a young girl in with a guy so much older and bigger. It started out innocent enough. We shared some common interests and in such as reading and video games, and he seemed to not be as violent with me, maybe because I was family, it's hard to say. It got to the point that we were talking or hanging out every day. People often mistook him for my older brother. When I got to be about 9 or 10, things started to change. By that time, he was 17, kicked out of school, and regularly intimidating people. He was socially awkward to the point that I was the only person who he could have a conversation with, and he came to depend on my presence. I couldn't hang out with friends or have free time, or he would call up screaming and cry that I was betraying him or abandoning him. Then the threats started. I remember being in his apartment with him one day while his parents were out and he was showing me a new knife that he bought. For whatever reason, I was never afraid of him. Even when he would have outbursts around me, it always seemed I could calm him down and I couldn't imagine he would hurt me as I was his only friend. It was this day that he dropped the bomb that we were going to run away from home when I turned 16 and that I was going to be his wife and take care of him like a mother basically while he would spend his days playing video games. I sort of laughed it off thinking it was a bizarre joke or some sort of game he was playing. This really made him angry. He flew off the handle and started screaming and waving the knife around with the blade out that we were meant for each other and there was no way he would let me live if he couldn't have me. Being a naive idiot, I didn't tell my parents or his parents, and things got worse from there. If I tried to put it off hanging out with him, he would threaten my parents or my cats or his parents. He would come to my apartment late at night, knock on the door, then run off, I guess to let me know he could. At the same time, he began doubling down on me being destined to be his lover. He would use his allowance to buy inappropriate clothing for me or flowers. He would write poems and fanfics about our life together. He would call me in the middle of the night and try to get me to talk about inappropriate things with him. He also became very controlling. It got to the point that just going to school for the day would set him off because it was less time that he got to spend with me. I remember him being about 14 and him killing his pet parrot in a fit of rage because I was late coming over to his apartment after school. It's cliche, but he was screaming, look what you made me do, over and over, then crying and hugging the parrot. It was one of the most terrifying things I've seen. He had a new parrot the next day. I can't remember how, but I ended up telling my parents about everything he was doing and that I was afraid to be around him. They banned him from seeing me anymore and told his aunt that he was scaring me and not to bring him to family get-togethers. I was honestly relieved and thought it was over, 
and then I could start living some sort of life of my own without being tied to the hip to him. But then the threatening phone calls and the text messages and the social media messages started. He would either try to catfish me by pretending to be someone else, or he would straight up tell me that I was going to die soon, or my family was, and it was my fault for ruining his life. He sounded so deranged, the way he would scream and scream, his all caps messages. I had to stop going out for walks because he started showing up and watching me. I honestly thought that he was going to end my life. Every day was constant fear until I was 16 or so and got my first boyfriend. When he heard that I was with someone, I got my last message from him, saying that I betrayed him in the worst way possible, and one day, it could be weeks from now, or years from now, he would find me and end me. Everything died down after that. He never came to family gatherings and became a complete shut-in and lives off his parents playing video games all day. He found someone online that he started to talk to which I guess took his focus off of me. My life went back to some sort of normality until I was 21. Then I received a phone call from him asking me to help get his life back together because, according to him, the day I left his life was the day that he lost all hope. I hung up on him. It's been years now. He's in his mid-thirties, still completely shut in. I still fear he'll come for me one day. I see him every once in a while walking around where I now live. He looks terrifying. There is honestly so much more to this story that I've forgotten over the years. It has become such a blur due to a lot of other stuff that I was coping with around the same time, but I can say he made my life a nightmare for many years. Some of the more painful aspects of the story I can't even get into without throwing myself into a fit of anxiety. I hope to God that I never have to be in the same room as him again, because if that happens, I don't think I'll come out the other side alive. I have been dating my girlfriend for about two and a half years. She's a small blonde with a positive attitude about everything. We both go to college, so we only get to see each other so much. Her college is in New Hampshire and mine is in Massachusetts. Since she doesn't have a car, I will drive up to hers and my old little red car that I got from my grandmother. I am not a huge fan of the car, but I got it basically free, so I can't complain. I never had an issue making this hour and a half drive, but a few weeks ago I got more than my fill. I was visiting my grandmother and it already was becoming a rough day. We wanted the dorm room to ourselves, but her annoying roommate wouldn't leave, so we hung out in the common room. After spending most of the day together, we finally called it time for me to head back to my own college. I said goodbye and that I would text her when I got back. It was 6 o'clock anyways, and it was getting pretty dark outside given that it was winter. I normally take the New Hampshire back roads for a more scenic route and also to avoid traffic. It doesn't affect the time of traveling at all either, so that's a plus. Most people who live in or visit New Hampshire know that most of the back roads are not lit well with street lights or are not even lit at all. This isn't too much of a problem because I can just put it on my high beams. About 30 minutes of driving, I turned down a road that looked as if though it was just a wide path. The GPS said that I would be going straight for about 7 miles and due to knowing about the way New Hampshire roads could be, I didn't think anything of it. The street was like how I mentioned before and was narrow enough for a car and a half, was surrounded by woods, and was not lit with street lights at all. I got about three or four miles in and saw a guy in my high beam standing in the middle of the road. He was waving down my car asking for help. The road wasn't big enough for me to pass around him so I had to stop. The man then came around to my driver's side window and gestured for me to put it down. I wasn't fully thinking straight so I put my window down about halfway. He looked like an average 40 to 45 year old man but he gave off a disturbing presence. He told me he was having car troubles and asked me to get out of my car and help him. Now, I'm a 19-year-old and have an average build with brown surfer-style hair. 
None of my physical qualities hint to me knowing anything about cars. I then told him that I knew nothing about cars and that if he really needed help, that I could call him a mechanic or tow truck. He kept gesturing to his black, rusted pickup truck and insisted that I got out to help him. This started to give me the chills, and I didn't know what to do. That's when I noticed that there was someone crouching behind his truck. The man couldn't tell, but I began to internally panic. My fight-or-flight senses kicked into gear, and I chose to try something risky. I then told the guy that I would pull over on the side of the road ahead and get out to see what I can help him with. This seemed to work, and the guy began to smile. He backed off of my car, and I stepped as hard as I could on my gas pedal. I sped off and looked into my rearview mirror to see both men run out into the middle of the road and just stand there. I kept driving as fast as I could until I got off the road to a nearby gas station where I stopped to call the police. I told the dispatch my experience and asked them if I needed to stick around for questioning. They told me they would send some officers out to check the street and I was fine to continue on driving. I then called my girlfriend and told her what had happened. She was just happy I was safe. I have no idea what those guys' intentions were. I don't know if they were actually having car troubles or if I was going to get carjacked or worse. Needless to say, after that night, I'll not be driving the back roads alone at night anymore. So my significant other and I were talking once after reading stories to each other for this very subreddit and started telling one another about creeps we had known in the past. It became clear after a while that we had known the same creep mere months apart before we had even met each other. So let me tell you about the tale, the tale of Carl. So I would say about eight years before my significant other and I had met, my ex and I were in the market for a roommate to take up the slack on the rent that the previous roommate left behind. We found it in an individual named Carl. Now, things seemed okay with Carl. He went to class and worked part-time, kept the place clean, and paid rent on time. We even hung out as a group whenever we could arrange it and watch things together. We thought everything was cool. So cool, in fact, we saw no problem with leaving Carl alone in the apartment while my ex and I went on a trip with my ex's family. During the trip, Carl let us know he needed to move out because he had lost his job and was having trouble finding another. This is important. We said that was fine and he just had to be out by the time we got back, and he said that was not a problem since this gave him almost 60 days to find a new place and we would just take the rent he couldn't pay out of the security deposit. So time goes by and we get back and see a bunch of suitcases and no Carl. And my ex and I think, oh, he really cut this close, but whatever, these things happen. Then we see a random woman exit Carl's room, but think nothing of it, because they must be here to help Carl move, right? No. This woman, Nancy, walks up to my ex and I and asks, who are you and what are you doing in Carl's apartment? Then, the story unfolds. So while we were gone, Carl decided they weren't super big on the idea of leaving and had moved Nancy in, telling them they owned the whole big studio apartment. Those bags from earlier? Those were her bags. She was moving in. Into our room. Carl had told her that my ex and I had skipped out and was left behind to take care of our stuff and throw it all away and this and that and the other. Just an endless sea of lies. We had to show Nancy the lease in our text to prove that Carl was subleasing from us before she would believe us, and then we offered her Carl's spot since we did have a vacancy, which they accepted since they had just moved out of their dorms and had nowhere to go now. Things are going okay, and we are all geared up to face Carl when he gets home from work when Nancy mentions something offhandedly that Carl had been putting peanuts in the milk in the fridge this morning before he left. Now, my ex had a terrible peanut allergy and loves milk. If he had taken one sip, they would have probably died because we did not have any EpiPens and Carl knew that. 
Now, with attempted murder now revealed and a single white female coming to mind, Carl strolls in, sees us, and says out loud, Oh God! Yeah, oh God is right. He was very surprised that Nancy was not on his side, and that he really had to leave right that second, and that she had ratted him out about the milk when he tried to get my ex to drink it to prove it wasn't tainted. I repeat, Carl told my ex to drink the milk repeatedly to prove his innocence, not dump the milk out and look for peanuts, drink the milk, and when you don't die, it proves I didn't poison it. Yeah, that's a big no. So we made Carl pack that instant and leave because we were young and didn't think the police would take any of this seriously since they had a record of avoiding things that were not cut and dry. Now at this point, you may be saying to yourself, work? But I thought Carl didn't have a job and that's why he had to leave. That's where my significant other, whom I would not meet for years, mind you, came in. For you see, the place that Carl got a job at was my significant other's place of work. Carl was hired to stock the shelves and that was it. Just stock the shelves. Not clean or do inventory or anything else. Just stock the shelves. Carl proceeds to follow customers around and harass them about what they were going to buy so he would know what to get more of from the back. He went so far as to pick through their carts to see what items they had while they were still shopping and follow them through the aisles, mostly women. Carl would also sit on the floor of the aisles with Nancy and just talk, blocking everyone and not moving unless someone told him to. And since this was a specialty shop with intermittent traffic, this could be quite a while, but it was also preferable to him harassing the customers, so management let it go. So what finally got Carl fired, you may ask? Well, the owner of the store came in very early one day to do inventory and saw that lights were on in the basement of the building. They followed those lights to the stockroom and found Carl sleeping there on a pile of product. When they told him to leave, he asked when he could come back and they told him never, to which he seemed rather angry. He tried just showing up to work several times after that like nothing happened and everyone had to keep kicking him out. From what I understand, he had a place to go. He just didn't want to pay rent there and thought if he slept in the stockroom, he wouldn't have to leave. No one, either myself or my significant other knows, has seen or heard from Carl since. And we are all fine with that. This story happened about four years ago, spanning the end of my grade 10 year to halfway through my grade 11. I was in the band room of my school where my friends and I liked to hang out and eat our lunches since we were all friends with the band teacher. But one day, there were a few new people there. One of them was Tim. Tim was in grade 12, I was in grade 10, and we hit it off immediately. It was like we were almost the same person. Interests, hobbies, activities, etc., I didn't see it at the time, but he was basing all of his likes off of mine. We exchanged information like Snapchat, Discord, phone number, and the whole lot, and we spent a lot of time talking. This is where things started to go downhill. I was talking to him, and at this point we had known each other for about a week and some change. He says to me that he's in the hospital for attempting to end his life and that he's really sorry. As soon as I saw this, I started crying as I and other people knew he did actually have depression and tendencies of that nature. While he was in the hospital for the week and a half he was there, he kept trying to get me to come to see him while using the classic, I'll end my life if you don't come see me bit. I, however, could not go, as the mental health recovery unit where I live has a strict family-only policy for patient safety. I explicitly told him that I could not see him, and he kept trying to manipulate me into doing so. A few weeks later, just after school ended and Tim and I had been talking for a while, I got a message from this girl named Sarah in my Instagram DM saying things like, How dare you flirt with my boyfriend? Or, Why did you come on to him when he has a girlfriend? And things like that. I don't remember exactly, as I wanted to block this whole period of time out. After a while of explaining and telling her that I did not know he had a girlfriend, 
She explains to me that he's done this thing before and to just stop talking to him. Also that he did the same thing to her initially, and now she's so far trapped in this abusive relationship that she can't get out. His M.O. per se was preying on young naive girls for mental validation, all the while making them feel horrible for not doing things for him. Before Sarah coming to me, there were red flags and sirens going off in my head, but I chose to ignore them since I didn't and still don't like breaking things off with people without a good reason. When he invited me out, I'd make excuses since my gut told me to run. But I didn't run, at least not before Sarah. After the explanation, I quickly started ghosting Tim. It was pretty simple, since we didn't actually have any overlapping activities or hobbies, so all I had to do was block him on social media and block his number. Fast forward to the end of November of my grade 11 year. I'd forgotten about Tim and tried my hardest to push what he did out of my brain. Guess who pops into the only social media DM I forgot to block him on, but Tim himself. And me being the trusting person I was saw nothing wrong with it. Maybe he changed. Maybe he was a different boy by now. He told me he was off for Christmas break the week after and wondered if I wanted to go to a frat party with him. Now the flags are rising and I say, sure, why not? Then text Sarah about what's happening. During this hiatus from Tim... Sarah and I built quite a close friendship. She says she didn't even know he was coming back and that he told her that he was going to Cancun with his family for the holiday, leaving on December 5th, but that she's away at her father's place about 45 minutes out of town for the week of the party and to do as I see fit. I wanted to have some fun, so I went to this party. I was easily the youngest person in the whole party. As I was only 16 at the time, I didn't feel comfortable drinking in a place other than my home, so I chose not to drink. Tim, however, does drink. Once he was drunk enough for his liking, we get up to go, and I know where I live pretty well. Not a big city, but not a small one either, and we went down a street I had never been down before. Again, red flags were going off, and I was tense and jumpy. There's no one on the street and no lights on in the houses, Tim then plants himself in front of me and tries to kiss me. I, being 16 and never having kissed anyone before, didn't take well to this. Luckily at the time my mother was making me take a lady's self-defense course so I punched him in the eye, kicked his groin and booked it. Some people might say that this was an overreaction, but I've been harassed before and didn't want to take my chances with a drunk guy, even one I knew. I bus it home from downtown, and when I get home, it's a little after 10.30 at night. I didn't tell my mom since I was scared she'd get mad at me for being at a party. I was irrational and, in hindsight, probably should have told her. I immediately text Sarah to tell her what happened, and she doesn't reply until the next morning. From what she said, he texted her all sweet-like, and she gave him the address of her dad's place where she was staying while he was on a business trip. He got there, still intoxicated and angry, hit her a few times and verbally abused her until she had to leave and go to her mother's house. I tell Sarah that I'm sorry for what happened and hope it never happens again, but that I cannot keep talking to her unless I want Tim in my life, which I didn't. Back to today, and Sarah is still with Tim, and I see her around sometimes with a black eye one day or a swollen cheek the next. To this day, I have trust issues with guys and it's extremely hard for me to form romantic relationships for fear that this will happen again. Before cutting off contact with Sarah, I did offer help and she said that other friends did too, but she didn't want people tied up in her mess. I still say hi every once in a little while, maybe once a year, just to catch up. But that's it. This happened to me during the summer between middle school and high school. My addict older brother Jason had just moved out of my mom's garage. They'd had a falling out over something and it was a relief when he was gone. Not long after that, I moved into the garage in his place. I had only been living in there less than a week when it happened. I was vegging on some good old-fashioned MMO gaming with a group of friends when I excused myself to go to the bathroom. 
Since the door to the garage was separate from the house, I stepped onto the porch and went over to the backslider. There was a sticky note on it that informed me that my family had gone to the store and would be back soon. This immediately made me nervous, as I would have preferred to have been told, but I brushed it off and went inside. Our two large dogs, Bella and Sadie, harmless but intimidating, were sleeping behind a baby gate, separated in my mom's bedroom and what was once mine, but now in the process of being made into a playroom for my three-year-old niece, Kate. There really wasn't much furniture in it other than some toys and two plush chairs, so the door was closed to discourage the dogs from going in there. They weren't destructive and were allowed to roam as they wanted to for the most part, but one of them, Bella, had a habit of eating whatever she could find. So when we weren't home, they were usually crated or kept out of places that they could eat things, aka the kitchen. The bathroom door was just before the gate, so I said hello and went in. I closed the door, locked it, did my business, and washed my hands. After that, since I was there, I grabbed hold of my hairbrush. Then I heard it. I thought I was crazy at first. Something I wonder if I still am. The latchable door to the baby gate clicked open, which isn't something any of our animals were capable of doing. I heard movement before the distinct sound of dog collars passing by the door. Bella and her sister Sadie didn't bark or growl, they just rushed by, straight towards the kitchen. I was paralyzed with fear and I didn't dare move. I held my breath with a hand over my mouth, extremely worried. Our dogs were lovable, but if this had been a stranger, they would have been barking. Whoever had let them out of the gate knew them. I tried to tell myself that maybe if it was my family, but considering they'd all gone and they weren't exactly the type of people to come home quietly, I knew that was a mistake. It got worse from there, and I'll never forget the sound of the bedroom door that was mine less than a week ago creaking open slowly. There was a long pause and I heard either Bella or Sadie come close to the gate again briefly before she went back towards the kitchen. What felt like an eternity passed in complete deafening silence, only to be stopped suddenly by an echo of the baby gate clicking shut. It seemed like hours until I could hear the back door slide open and close, followed by more silence. I didn't move. What was I supposed to do? There was no telling if whoever was in there had actually left or not, and at the time it wasn't exactly common for people to have cell phones, especially kids my age, so I had no way of contacting my family or even calling the police. Eventually I worked up the nerve and pushed the door open. Almost immediately Bella and Sadie ran up to me for attention before wandering off again, seemingly unfazed, but still on the opposite side of the gate that they'd been on before I'd entered the bathroom. The door to Kate's new playroom was open just a bit, enough for someone to peer inside despite having been closed before that. I convinced myself it was all in my head, but hid in the bathroom until I heard my family come home. After explaining what had happened, the police were called and canvassed the area, but found nothing. Our home backed up to a park that was notorious for suspicious night activity, so anyone could have hopped the fence easily. My mother had a theory that it was probably Jason, trying to break in to steal money and I didn't argue but I didn't agree with her. If it had been Jason, it would have been even more unnerving that the person in question had only looked in the room that was once mine and hadn't seemed to be shifting around looking for money. I was a teenager. I didn't exactly have money in there. Deep down, I was terrified it was one of Jason's many creepy, old addict friends who he always brought by. They were always really unnerving and stared at me in ways that made me extremely uncomfortable. I was scared that they were stalking the house before they saw my family leave without me, and since they wouldn't have known I was in the garage and I had taken down the we're going to the store note, it probably looked as if though I was home alone and in my room. I hate to think what would have happened had I been...
It all started around two years ago when I was driving with a friend of mine back from our friend's house, who lived in a nearby town, around a 10 minute drive from our town. It was around 12.30 in the morning, and about a third of the way home a pair of headlights appeared in the rearview mirror. The lights came closer and closer to the back of the car, and I presumed it was someone in a rush who wanted me to speed up. They couldn't overtake as the road is single lane with sharp turns every hundred meters or so. As I got into town I noticed that they were following the same path as me, so slowed right down and pulled into the side of the road so they could overtake me. However, they continued following me, slowing down and pulling in. My friend noticed and suggested I went the long way to his house, so I drive around town for about 10 minutes, taking extremely odd routes that you would never normally take. I eventually got to my friend's house and pull over at the side of the road. The car that was following us drives past us extremely slowly and I catch a glimpse of the driver, a middle-aged man with black sunglasses. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to describe him any further on here, but he looked extremely like a well-known journalist. The car was all blacked out, brand new Range Rover, and it pulled up around 50 meters ahead of us. My friend got out of the car and noticed that the car stayed there, idling. He said he lives on the sort of road that you know all the cars that frequently drive down it, and he'd never seen this car before. We both decided to drive to a pub where I was going anyway, but again take an odd route there. I quickly turn the car around and drive to a nearby off-road track, turning all the lights off to wait for a few minutes before driving through town again. A few minutes after setting off, the car passes us on the opposite side of the road and immediately breaks and performs a U-turn in the road. At this point, I accelerate and speed through town, but the car catches up. I decide to slow down, approaching a roundabout, and drive around it multiple times at slow speed. The car follows us, constantly staying a few feet behind my car. I speed off in the direction of the pub and, almost crashing, pull into the road that the pub is on at the last second. This caused the car to drive on, but it slowed down. The road that the pub is on is separated from the main road by a large playing field with a few trees. There are no lights down this road, so I turned out my headlights and drove up the hill of the pub car park, hiding the car behind the pub's decking area. We get out of the car and see the car turn around in the main road and drive up the road that the pub is on. We are met by a few of our friends at the pub, who my friend phoned when we were en route, explaining the situation to them. The car then proceeds to turn into the car park for the flats that are next to the pub and drives around the car park, with the occupants of the car shining torches out into the car park. After around ten minutes of this, the car slowly drives down the road, parking on the main road for a few minutes before driving off to never be seen again. I presume that maybe they had the wrong car at first, but had been followed a couple of times since this incident, not to the extent of this as I managed to lose them after a while. Around six months after this, I was driving off of the motorway at a town a few miles away and noticed a white rental van behind me. I didn't think anything of it until it followed my every turn I made. I again started crisscrossing the path I was taking and I eventually lost it by making an extremely last minute sharp turn. Again, I didn't link any of these until last month when I noticed a number of different cars taking turns to pull up outside my work, which is in a completely different area of the country. The cars would park next to the unit next door to work, facing my window, and sit there for an hour or so with their side lights on before driving off. This isn't a normal behavior in the area as I had never seen any cars parked outside that unit before, let alone keeping their side lights on. I'll need to give a little background to start. I live near Grand Rapids, Michigan. As most major cities, human trafficking happens quite frequently. The reason I mention this is because I go to college in this city and I am a 19, almost 20 year old female with brown hair and blue eyes. Due to my young age and appearances, I know I fit the target they look for. This happened to me today, February 26, 2019, for those who may read this later. 
I had just gotten out of class for the day. As normal, I headed towards my car, placed money on my student card so I could get out of the school parking garage and was on my way. Since I live a good 20 to 25 minutes away from Grand Rapids, I have to go onto the highway to get home. Instead of going home today though, I had made plans with one of my favorite teachers to help her out in her class and thank god I did. As I was getting off my exit, I noticed a white pickup truck behind me. At the time, I thought nothing of it and continued my normal routine. To get to my old teacher's place of work, I had to go past my house. When I look in my rearview mirror again, I notice this truck behind me still. I still shrugged it off, rationalizing that this truck just had a similar route as me. I stop next to a local bar and grill and take a right turn. This truck follows me. I was still trying to rationalize this and try my best to shut up my paranoid mind. I summon up to me just reading and listening to true scary stories too much. However, I'm unable to quiet my mind and am now picking up on just how far the truck is keeping its distance from me, as if the driver didn't want me to see who they were or make out any features. I take a left turn to get into the village where this teacher worked. This truck takes a left turn and follows me, but still keeps the same distance it had before. I am panicking at this point. All thoughts are racing through my mind, and my gut is screaming at me that this doesn't feel right. This truck had followed me all the way from the exit 95 on the highway all the way into Sparta. Still, part of me is trying to rationalize this. I take a deep breath and make a quick decision. When I get to the entryway to the elementary school, I will turn into there, go through the parking lot, and back out onto the road. If they follow me into the parking lot, I'll know for sure that this truck is following me. I turn into the parking lot, and this truck follows. I now know for sure that this vehicle is following me. As I continue through the parking lot, I believe the person inside this vehicle realized I knew they were following me, as their speed slowed incredibly. Still thinking I'm paranoid, I try to reason with myself that this person might be dropping off their kid or picking them up, but as I continue through the parking lot to leave, in my rear view mirror I see this truck slowly pull up to the T intersection as if watching me go. At this moment I know they have already passed the student pick up and drop off and there is no way they could be picking up their kid or dropping them off. Somehow, I am able to remain calm. I turn onto the road again, check behind me every few seconds to see if this truck is still following me. I turn down another road and park near a few houses, taking a couple of deep breaths, adrenaline still running through me. I stayed there for a few more moments just to make sure I lost the truck. Once I feel ready, I make my way towards a Bigby. Order the drinks I had planned to get myself and my teacher in the first place and make my way back to the school parking lot. The truck is nowhere to be seen. It's gone. It isn't until I am in the office that the adrenaline finally leaves my body and when the office lady asks me if I'm okay, I start crying and shaking. I told both my teacher and the office what had happened. I hugged my teacher as if my life depended on it and she told me to stop trying to rationalize this. This truck followed me for far too long and was acting so suspiciously that my teacher believes they had malicious intent. After a couple of more hours to process what has happened, I can't say for sure, but I believe this person was trying to catch me at my house or in a secluded area to try and kidnap me and possibly put me into human trafficking. I'm so glad I listened to my gut. This happened yesterday. Looking back now, it's slightly humorous in a white trash kind of way, and I wish I got it on camera. But at the time, my heart was pounding and the adrenaline was rushing. When I get home from work, I typically chill with my dog in the backyard, just relax a little after the day. After chilling with the pup a bit, I peek through the blind on the front door, purely on a whim. I see an old man walking away from our side gate, which is immediately to the right of our front door, but a little further back off the road. Never seen this dude before. He's clearly homeless due to his shoddy appearance, ripped clothes, and possibly poop-covered jeans. 
They cross the street. Of course, I go out front to keep an eye on this sketchy dude. He grabs his shopping cart and I figured he'll just wheel it on down the line and go on with his hobo business. But I'm posting this story, so clearly that didn't happen. He wheeled his hobo cart back across the street towards me and rolls right up my driveway. I retreat to the safety of my doorway. Can I help you? I said with as much attitude as I could muster. Homeboy can barely speak in a manner that I can understand. He is messed up, saying something about looking for my husband. I do have a boyfriend, but there is no way he could invite a bum to our home, and boyfriend is still on his way from work. I'm home alone, just me and the dog who is just standing inside wagging your tail. Thanks, Chiquita. The one time I want you to be scary and you gotta be all cute. You can't be here. Get out. I start to yell. Homeboy keeps speaking his own drunkard language, which I cannot understand. Now the neighbor kids from across the street show up at the end of my driveway. He's been hanging out in the front of our house all day. They start to explain. We were trying to just let him sleep it off. We went to get him water and a protein bar, but when we came back out, he was over here trying to steal your jack. My boyfriend has a trailer parked in our drive with various and sundry tools and equipment, including a car jack. Since the jack is still there, I'm unsure if Hobo was trying to steal things or not. These kids are known to be a little bit of troublemakers, so I'm taking their story with a grain of salt. Hobo did not like the neighbor kids telling me their story. He starts yelling at the kids, unintelligibly. He's mad, and he starts squaring up with the one kid. I'm so glad to see the kid is smart enough to dip and weave away from the old dude. I tell the kids not to engage with him, to go home. I'm calling the cops. The kids don't listen and hang around. To be fair, it was hard to look away from the hot mess trespassing on my front lawn. Our old buddy pulls a flagpole out of his cart and starts brandishing it, swinging it around like a baseball bat, at the kids. I dial 911. To their credit, the cops showed up in two minutes tops. The kids retreat across the street. Hobo begins to finally make his way down the street. The cop approaches and my boyfriend pulls up, just home from work. I have been keeping him fairly up to date via text while this whole ordeal unfolds. He hops out of his truck and approaches the cop and Hobo. Apparently this old dude has been around for a while. My boyfriend grew up in this neighborhood and has seen him around for ages. My boyfriend says he's mostly harmless and basically talks him down. I shared my story with one of the police officers who thanked me for giving them a call. He went and talked to the neighbor kids to get their story too. Old sketchy dude calmly rolls his cart away and the cops leave. Happy ending for now. I'm so glad no one was hurt. Later last evening I go to the quick mark a block down the road. Luckily I was feeling lazy and drove. When I pulled in, whose shopping cart do I see? You know. I got out and went to Walgreens instead. I'm hoping beyond imagine that old dude leaves us alone for now and doesn't try to break in today while everyone's at work. I'm on lunch break now, hoping I don't have to deal with more alky hobo drama later this afternoon. Please wish me luck. Over the summer, my friend and I got a call from another friend who asked us if we were up for an adventure. So naturally, we agreed. Our friend wouldn't tell us what this adventure was until we had already gotten into the car and were on our way. He laid out the plan to us. We were going to break into a cabin to meet a boy he met on Tinder. The area was pretty familiar to us and we were already mid-route, so we were down. We drove up this long driveway to get to the cabin that was isolated enough for us to not get caught, but not to the point where it was concerning or out of cell service. The boy we were meeting up with walks up the driveway and breaks into the cabin as we wait outside for him to open the front door. The friends immediately start exploring the cabin and going into all of the rooms, but I was feeling uneasy and stood in the kitchen. The boy we had met went into one of the other rooms and my friends returned to the kitchen with me. 
Tinder Boy walks back out into the kitchen carrying a shotgun and two rounds that he had retrieved from wherever he had gone. He starts pointing the gun around and I immediately begin yelling at him and asking him what he thought he was doing. After scaring the life out of all of us, he just laughed and put the gun on the kitchen table. Seeing we were uncomfortable, he tells us to follow him into the basement to which we all reluctantly agree. In the basement, we begin telling stories to break the ice and try to get to know what this boy's deal is. As he tells us his own story, he pulls out his pocket knife and starts throwing it around and sticking it into the wooden support posts, bringing back the anxiety in me. He then says he is bored in the basement and brings us up to the kitchen where he then steals alcohol from underneath the sink. He offers us all drinks, but my friends and I are more of the smoking type and didn't want to get caught, so we declined. We all rolled up and then head to the porch. On the porch, my friends and I are standing along the rail smoking, and he sat back behind us at a table. I get a weird feeling, so I turn around to find him taking pictures of us. This made me feel really uncomfortable, so I asked him what he was doing, and all he responded with was another laugh. My friends and I all share a WTF look, and after having a few drinks, he goes around back to relieve himself. My friends and I convene to share our uneasiness and decide we needed to get out of there ASAP. He comes back, and we had all made our way to the other side of the porch to distance ourselves from him. I look over again to find him taking yet another set of pictures of us, and at that point, I can't handle the anxiety, so I text my friend to fake a text from her gram so we had a reason to leave. She fakes the text, and we go inside to pack up our stuff. As we were packing up our stuff, he grabs the shotgun again and waves it at all of us one more time before putting it back. My one friend leaves a handful of change on the table as evidence in case Tinder Boy decides to strike and pull some stuff. This is slightly relevant later on. So our stuff was all gathered and we were all more than ready to leave. We walk outside and head towards the car when... Tinder boy pulls my friend aside explaining to him that he needed a ride back because he had a curfew. Because my friend was interested in this boy, still can't figure out why, he agreed to drive the Tinder boy home. The whole car ride I'm preparing myself to defend a knife attack which thankfully never happened. We drop him off and a wave of relief washed over me. I'd never have to see this psycho in the making ever again. Flash forward a few months... I was visiting home over Thanksgiving break and my friends told me he had showed up to their job. My two friends worked together. They said he pulled them aside and told them that if anyone were to ask, we had never went to that cabin and didn't know it existed. I'm assuming the owner noticed the change pile on the table and missing alcohol and alerted the police about it, but I'll never know for sure. Though ominous and bizarre, I just kind of laughed it off what they had told me because I now live four hours away. Months passed and I am currently on my spring break and am visiting home. A different set of friends and I decided to go to one of the local thrift stores and I needed a fitting room. I go up to one of the employees to ask for one and when he turns around, I realize it was the Tinder boy. My heart sunk and anxiety washed over me. He walked over to me and didn't say anything. I think my drastic hair change may have thrown him off, and thank God it did. This happened about three years ago on Halloween. It's part of the reason I hate going out on that holiday now. It's also why I grew distant from a once close friend, Hannah. So a little background just to understand how sketchy and creepy these people are. My sorority sister had started dating a dude in the summer. He seemed decent at first. However, as passive as this dude seemed, his friends weren't. The first time I was invited over to the boyfriend's home was in the summer. As I tried to sleep that night, I had two dudes in the same room as me making extremely inappropriate comments towards me, as well as talking about how they should pass me back and forth. Needless to say, I stayed up most of the night and I was reluctant to ever go back there, 
Something about these people just gave me bad vibes. Fast forward to Halloween. She invited me over again and I didn't really want to go. However, I am a sucker for the Nintendo 64 and I was rather interested in playing a few games. Between that and wanting to spend time with her, I finally relented and went over. The first two hours were normal. I was playing the N64 with some of the more normal friends, specifically Mario Kart and Smash Brothers. Halfway through the night, Joey comes in. I'd met him before, and he was your typical white trash guy. He was incredibly drunk and continued to drink as he waited for his brother to pick him up. I made small talk and was just BSing with them. Joey gets a call and picks up his phone claiming his brother is here, and he immediately picks up my coat and heads towards the door. I tell him it's my coat, thinking he might be too drunk to tell. He acknowledges that it is my coat, but he refuses to give it back. Everything of mine is in there, from my wallet to my pepper spray. He starts calling me a slew of derogatory names, and I slap him and grab my coat and sit down. What I hadn't noticed was that he had taken out the pepper spray at some point. As I sit and turn around, I hear a spraying noise, and immediately my face is on fire. He missed one of my eyes, thank God. However, he managed to spray my lower face, right eye, and mouth. It was like eating a very spicy and painful pepper. I couldn't recommend anyone inhale pepper spray at any point. I remember glaring at him and walking out to grab Hannah. Probably slightly terrifying for her as I come in, face red, eyes dripping, and this terribly angry look on my face. Meanwhile, she's getting nailed by her boyfriend. My eyes suffered way too much that night. They tried to kick him out, but he kept trying to attack me. Oddly enough, I didn't cry. I was just angry. Someone took my only defense and used it on me. I'm five foot one and not even 90 pounds. As he was screaming, he started going on about how he knows demons and I have no clue what they're like. He also started talking about how he was the Nephilim and basically went on a crazed rant which sounded extremely familiar plot-wise. I could barely contain my laughter as his crazed ranting was supposed to instill fear in me, but was in actuality the plot to Diablo 3. Nothing happened to him. I should have called the cops, but I didn't. He could have hurt me since my lungs are medically compromised. That pepper spray could have sent me to the hospital. The boyfriend and him continued to be friends for a while until Joey decided to punch him and give him a black eye, lost teeth, and a slew of other injuries. As for me, my face burned for the next 48 hours. I became distant from Hannah for a while, but during a dinner we had, she told me things that he'd said since then. How he'd do it again if he could. He bragged to everyone how he pepper sprayed me. I'm pretty sure this dude is actually psychotic. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, our Let's Read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.